I'm Ilan Gerno, Director of Policy Research here at the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm joined by my colleague, Steve Simpson, Director of Legal Studies. And we want to talk about uh, net neutrality. So recently, uh, President Obama has said he wants to see the FCC uh, have the authority to regulate the internet. So this is now a new push for net neutrality. What, in simple terms, are we talking about here? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, uh, one of the big problems with net neutrality is nobody seems to know what it is. Uh, people have this vague notion, net neutrality, we should treat all content providers or all data uh, uh, evenly and not discriminate against some data over others, but that's about the most you get out of people. When you try to reduce this to a, a real legal policy, it comes out as um, the idea that internet service providers, ISPs, that's Comcast and Time Warner and you know the other companies that create the internet infrastructure, it's literally the cables through which all of our signals go from the content providers to our, literally right up to our home. That these guys shouldn't be able to discriminate against certain types of data or content and over others. Uh, they should treat all data the same. You've heard this idea that information wants to be free and we shouldn't restrict it through the, you know, uh, through the mechanism of allowing people, uh, certain companies, to discriminate uh, against some types of content, let's say, in favor of Netflix or online gaming and against, you know, I don't know, Facebook or your own content that you might send out or different types of websites. That's the general idea. Now, there's a lot to speak about how this works in practice uh, because the the, the idea here, actually both the idea and the practice are very bad, uh, but people have this kind of general idea that if it's the internet, it's information, it's data, somehow, you know, we don't have to worry about discriminating or treating some uh, types of data differently. So just the way it's framed, neutrality, makes it seem like, well, why would you want anything else? Right. And I mean, it's, it's curious to me. So what, is, what do you think is the best case that people have put forward for enforcing new kind of controls yeah, so on the internet? Sure. So there are two arguments that I think people make that are superficially convincing. One is we don't want these big faceless companies to control what we're allowed to say and what data we're allowed to get and what we're allowed to, to uh, transmit over the internet. This is the idea that information is supposed to be free. And sometimes I think that it, this, this has echoes of freedom of speech and freedom of thought and the information I get uh, through the information superhighway shouldn't be controlled by some company. So that's kind of, that's part of one uh, argument. The other argument, which I think is a little more sophisticated and a little bit more uh, understandable, is that people remember having trouble with their cable companies, and I even sometimes have trouble with my own cable company. I'm not a huge fan of it. And that the idea that these sort of people look at it as cable monopolies, these big companies that control the, the choices I have in terms of the cable shows that I can watch, I don't want them to be able to control what content I can get over the internet. So there, there, there's a dovetailing of these two arguments. The one that does make some sense is there is a lot of control by local cable companies, the ISPs that deliver your internet service. They have a lot of control over what you can get uh, in certain circumstances, and certainly while there is cer there's competition, I read a statistic not long ago that in something like 80% of the jurisdictions in the country, people have at least two choices for internet uh, service providers. But still, it's not the kind of vibrant marketplace that we've come to expect, uh, expect. so you don't have quite the, the same number of choices, and I think people are worried if these companies can control what I can get over the internet, maybe I won't be able to get my content out there, I won't be able to get the type of content that I want. Now, there's a lot wrong with that argument, but... Uh, so how do they end up that way? How is it that when you have a house, you can get maybe one or two providers? Yes, yeah, so there is an area in which the government actually is enforcing a certain level of control over our internet, and it's it's not, I think, what a lot of people think. People tend to look at the federal government as the one that's the that's the operative or relevant player here. And certainly with net neutrality, if we're gonna have national rules that govern all ISPs and how they provide uh, this content, it would be at the federal level. But the real culprit here, to the extent there's a problem with getting internet service, it's local governments. Local governments have long had uh, control over cable providers, at least on, you've heard the expression, the last mile. Well, the last mile is governed by local government. So it's, it's literally the, the utility uh, regulatory commissions that regulate whether, literally, where the cables can be hung, 
how many of them, who gets access to the telephone poles or if it's underground, who gets access to that, what taxes and regulation, regulatory hoops they have to jump through. So local government has a lot of control over this. And uh, I talk often about the topic of cronyism. You want an example of cronyism. Mm. Imagine what it's like to have to navigate all those local hoops and all of the different people that you have to you know, satisfy to get to that last mile to be able to access the person's house. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't think it's quite accurate to say these companies have monopolies because there is some competition. But given the amount of taxes, regulatory hoops they have to jump through, it's enormously difficult for them to uh, access that last mile. It takes a big company to be able to do that. And as a result, you have a kind of bottleneck. So people's perception on the ground level is, you know, personally, I don't like my internet carrier. I'd like to get a different internet carrier. But every time I check, they haven't yet gotten to the point of getting the cables uh, up to my house. Um, so I have to wait. And it seems like my company has a kind of monopoly. It's not really true. It's not, and I wouldn't even blame them. I would blame the local regulators. But if there's a problem here, it's at the local level restricting the ability of, of more competition to happen. Now, in reading on this, I found a number of arguments where the problem is one that's hypothesized. Or what would happen if? And the one that, I, that struck me as at least sympathetic is suppose the next YouTube, the next Netflix comes around, or the next Facebook, or the next big thing comes around. The innovators are there, and there isn't net neutrality, and they have to pay a premium to get their uh, websites seen. And, and try. Now, what would happen to innovation, right? And, and from my perspective, is I love to see this innovation. It's amazing what right. we've seen on the internet, but the threat we're told is that would be throttled. Yeah. So the interesting thing about arguments like this is it's always the next one that's supposedly not going to work. And the reason they always have to focus on the next one is that the previous ones, previous ones have worked out fine. It's, you know, it's worth noting that there hasn't really been any kind of legal regime that has enforced net neutrality. Um, there have been attempts by the government to enforce net neutrality. In certain cases, the government has, has sort of de facto regulated by, uh, by controlling uh, mergers and other agreements among companies and, and building in certain conditions. But by and large, we've had uh, a kind of free system, with the, with the big exception being local cable restrictions, as I talked about a minute ago. And all of these companies that people are worried about flourishing in the future have flourished just fine up until now. Now, the bottom line is this. There's a demand, huge demand for what the internet provides people. Huge demand means lots of money at stake. The ISPs that carry all these signals, people need to recognize that without having content to carry, these guys are out of business, right? It, it behooves them to try to provide the best content to their, uh, uh, to their viewers because they want to make money at it. They have an incentive to you know, finance and help the next YouTube or Facebook or whatever, and certainly to deal with the companies. Um, that, that exist now. If you look at the history, I mean, this is really a broader question about the history of the development of capitalism in the free market. And the bottom line is this, if there's demand, if there's a good reason to provide a new service, and, and there are all kinds of incentives for companies to provide the best service for their customers, the customers will find a way. That one of the best uh, stories I like to, to talk about in this one is, is the, the kind of now famous story that Steve Jobs, when he invented the iPhone, he was basically inventing something that people didn't know they wanted, right? And his view was, I'm going to provide a product not based on, you know, not based on surveys and market research, because people don't know they want an iPhone yet. I'm going to provide a, a product that I think is a great product and that people will buy because it's a great product. You see examples of this through the history of capitalism and the free market repeatedly. The bottom line is this. If there is a demand for a product, people will find a way to uh, provide it and to finance new products so long as government doesn't get in the way. What we need to do with net neutrality, like every other uh, area of the market and innovation, is get government out of the way. Um, uh, and uh, you know the, the companies will find a way to produce all of this, uh, uh, these great products that we enjoy. What's your big takeaway from this development with Obama and the move to push net neutrality forward? Yeah, this is a bad development. It's a really bad development. I mean, it's not just a matter of um, you know, getting the internet service that we have come to enjoy. This is a real shot against innovation. Uh, I think it's very telling 
the metaphors and the analogies that people who are in favor of net neutrality end up using. So Obama has used the information superhighway, um, which it's understandable why people analogize the, uh, the net to a superhighway. But it's worth remembering, you know, what it's like to be stuck in traffic with, you know, thousands of other drivers. Uh, because your roads are controlled by a source that is not open to competitive forces. And that's what real equality looks like. Everybody's stuck in traffic. Um, by, by contrast, you look at the, at, uh, um, at the uh, areas of the market that have remained free. We have innovation. We have people providing services that customers want. We have flourishing. We have a million different, you know, diverse uh, um, possibilities. This is a real shot at innovation. It's an effort to turn the internet uh, into, heck, pick any number of examples. Public utilities, another uh, analogy that they've, they've made. Well, you know, do you really like dealing with the electric company or the gas company? It's horrible experience. You, they, they treat you uh, like you're not a customer at all, like you're you know, just a, a member of the public being treated by a bureaucrat who doesn't really care about your, your desires or your interests. Uh, think about Amtrak. I mean, that's what, that's what uh, um, uh, regulation ends up looking like. Uh, you know, uh, the railroads have been regulated now for a century and, and slowly uh, strangled out of existence. That's what we're talking about. We, uh, do we want the net to really look like that? No, of course not. Um, bottom line is this. The internet service providers um, have created this amazing product. They invest billions of dollars in this. They're private companies. They had to create the, the network through which all of our internet content um, travels. They have every right. And in fact, we want them to exercise their discretion to try to provide new products. Um, it's really outrageous that we, you know, with a new product like this, that we look at it as, thanks for creating this amazing, you know, new innovation, for investing billions of dollars. Now that you've created something that we've all come to rely on, that we all like, we want to effectively shackle you and uh, and put government in control. One of the things that really kills me about this debate is people think that the alternative is between a big company controlling it and then somehow, I don't know, some benevolent magical ruler who can provide, you know, endless uh, amounts of, uh, of bandwidth to the public for free. It's not, that's not the choice we're looking at. We're looking at the choice between private companies who have an incentive to provide you with a product that you want versus faceless bureaucrats that have no incentive to do that at all and ultimately control your choices by the force of law. How can people think that those are equivalent choices? They're not at all. The private market, um, private individuals, and freedom is the, is, should be the rule in this area. Uh, and that's the, that's the ultimate lesson here. This is a real shot at people's ability to innovate and to live you know, free, happy lives. So your description of how there's a new innovation and then the producers are shackled, I mean, it brings to mind comments that Mark Cuban, the entrepreneur, made on Twitter recently yeah. where he compared the push for net neutrality to the storyline in Atlas Shrugged. I'm interested in how, what do you think of those parallels? Yes, yeah, so he, he said at one point, one of his tweets was, if Ayn Rand were alive today and writing Atlas Shrugged, she would have chose the internet as the main industry that she focuses on as opposed to railroads. And when I first read that, I thought, ah, you know, it's interesting. And then the more I thought about it, the more I looked at, into it, the more I thought, he's really onto something here because the, the, it, there's a real parallel between how the railroads were treated, uh, both when they uh, came on the scene, how they were regulated, uh, the, the, the railroads that were much more, were run by real entrepreneurs as opposed to involving government private partnerships, uh, and how the internet is being viewed today. So, you know, railroads, important new innovation, absolutely vital for the economy, you know, transported products across the United States. They were the lifeblood, the kind of circulatory system of the economy, just like what the internet is today. Um, today, most people forget that the, that the railroads were real, the railroad magnates were real entrepreneurs, James J. Hill, you know, Cornelius Vanderbilt, really great industrialists that made um, the railroads, the vibrant uh, business that they, uh, that they were. And then you had like the Transcontinental Railroad and other railroads that were real government-private partnerships and all of the abuses that people came to heap on the railroads happened in the context of government involvement in the railroads. So the real villain was government involvement in the railroads. 
I think that something similar is happening today. So the internet is this, this you know, cornerstone. It's a, it's, it's a real important aspect of our economy today. The, the things that people are annoyed about are the result of government involvement in the internet. They tend to credit the government for the creation of the internet. I mean, when it started, the internet was what? It was a, it was a network among government contractors and, uh, and university uh, you know, researchers who were the beneficiaries of government grants. It was just this, this tiny little network that allowed them to share information, nothing like what it is today, and yet the government somehow gets credit for that. Um, you know, the private market has taken over the internet and made it what it is today. And now they want to shackle it in exactly the way the railroads uh, have been shackled, and for all the same reasons. It's, it's egalitarianism, it's a kind of hatred of private business, it's a, either a failure to understand or, or purposeful evasion of the fact that, as I said a minute ago, this takes, um, this takes millions, billions of dollars of, of investment by private entrepreneurs who are running these companies. Uh, you know, what they deserve from us is a thank you, not criticism for having uh, uh, created this wonderful thing that we've all now come to rely on. And if there is any culprit here, it's, it's government regulation. So as I said a minute ago, the choice between, the choice that we face now is the same choice that uh, people faced with the railroads. And we can see the evidence of railroad regulation. It's Amtrak, you know, a tiny little government run uh, uh, railroad that basically stretches between DC and New York. That's pretty much the only real use in you know, the Eastern seaboard and the Eastern corridor. Um, uh, versus the vibrant internet that we've come to know and expect. If we want to have that thing continue, the internet and the innovation that we've gotten, the answer should be hands off, keep government out. Please do not treat this like, an, uh, like a utility or make the same mistake that we've made in the past. Thanks, Steve.